Good evening, everyone. How are you all? Welcome to First Aid AMC MCQ free two week session. So, we just have our one of the free session with you a few days ago, right? So, first of all, we had a psychiatry trial class that was on 16th of April. And then after that, we started our free two week sessions from 2nd of May. And we had our some question solvation tips and tricks. Tonight, you are going to learn that how we take our medicine theory classes. And one of the most important topic in medicine is cardiology. So we are going to mainly focus on the theory today. Usually we need two class to finish cardiology. So tonight we are going to cover half of it and then the rest of it on our next class. After that, you're, we are going to solve some questions on cardiology, but before we do that, there are two more classes on recent question solve with, our, with some of our other mentors. So one class will be taken by Dr. Rabia, that's on 10th of May. And then there is another class on 13th of May, which will be taken by Dr. Aruz. So you, you will get to learn about our mentors and everyone and get to learn more about how we take classes. And that's actually the idea of this free two week session so that you know where you are going to enroll yourself. And then if you like it, if you feel that this is what you need to pass your exam, then you enroll. And I can see that most of you who are here, you guys already has enrolled into the course. And that's also good because sometimes we need to have some time for you to give access to our portal and everything. So it's not a bad idea that if you think that this is the right course for you, then just reach to us, start the process so that we can at least enroll you at the right time. Okay, so let's just start our theory session then. So we are going to start with cardiology. And after we finish this cardiology topic, you can again ask me any questions regarding the course and we will go through a little bit about the course course outlook a little bit to find out that like if you have any questions, if there is anything that you want to know about it, we will go through that question and answer session. All right. This is start with cardiology. First of all, I would like you to watch this video to know how cardiology actually should work and what's the main pathophysiology of your heart. Okay. Let's have a look on this video. And I'm sure most of you, you already know about it, but still we should at least know what's the systole, what's the diastole, how actually heart works, okay? So let's start with the video first. The normal heart has two sides, a right side and a left side, and four chambers, the top receiving chambers or atrium, and the lower chambers, which are thick walled pumping chambers called the ventricles. Red blood cell will come from either the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava and enter into the right atrium. The blood then flows across the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. The right ventricle then squeezes and ejects that blood cell into a vessel called the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery splits into two vessels, each going to the lungs. As that red blood cell makes its way through the lung, it returns through the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. That blood is now oxygenated. It's picked up oxygen, then goes across the mitral valve into the left ventricle, which does most of the work in terms of delivery of blood flow to the body. That blood cell is now ejected into the aorta to some organ or muscle or skin in the human body. Okay, so that's the basic function of your heart that you should first know about. Now, if you haven't got the idea from the video, let me just discuss a little bit before even we start cardiology theory, we need to know about it first. So let's say that this is your, let's say that this is your heart. And we know that our heart has four chambers, right? And so this is your right atrium, that's left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. So 
basically blood will flow from superior vena cava into the right atrium and also venous blood from lower extremity will be carried by inferior vena cava and it will be also taken to right atrium. So superior vena cava will carry blood from the upper extremity and inferior vena cava will carry blood from lower extremity. And all of these venous blood will bring the deoxygenated blood into your right atrium. After that, from right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, blood will go to the right ventricle. And then the blood is supposed to go from right ventricle through the pulmonary artery into the lungs. Okay? So, so far, right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, all of these will carry deoxygenated blood. Once blood moves into the lung, in the lung, the blood will get oxygenated and that oxygenated blood will be carried by pulmonary vein into your left atrium. And from left atrium, through the mitral valve, blood will go to the left ventricle. And then from left ventricle, through aorta, blood will go to the whole body. So you have got four chamber, you have got four heart valve, tricuspid, pulmonary, mitral, and aortic. Each time when your heart is getting the blood in inside the heart, your heart needs to relax so that it can get filled with blood, right? That relaxation is what we call as diastole. And then when it gets filled, it needs to pump the blood to your aorta so that the blood can go into your body. And this pumping action or is squeezing is what we call as systole. So this is diastole and systole. That's how your heart is usually working throughout, the, throughout your life, right? So if you know this, then it becomes a lot easy for you to understand a lot of pathophysiology that we are going to discuss. Is this clear for everyone, how the, how the heart is supposed to work? Great. Now let's move on to our theory session today then. So for cardiology, what are the research that we are supposed to follow? First of all, mainly when we take these sessions, we follow this tour, JM 8th edition and Kaplan step to CK. So John Murtag, that's the first thing that we are supposed to follow. With that, we always take some help from Kaplan step to CK book. So for, for JM, these are the chapters which we are going to follow for your cardiology preparation. So chapter 30, 59, 75, then up to 78. The most important is the chapter 30, which is the chest pain chapter. And others, we have palpitations, we have heart failure, we have cardiovascular disease, dyslipidemia, those chapters are here. Kaplan step to CK cardiology, we have taken all the important information into the lecture note already. So if you follow the lecture note only, that should be fine. We also sometimes follow RACGP guideline. That's the guideline that you are supposed to follow for medicine. And that's the Australian guideline. A lot of information that, that's needed and not given in your gem can be found in RACGP guideline. And obviously you should go through our lecture note, the recording of this class, if you haven't taken the live session, and then you can go through the Q bank to solve some questions. After you have got enough information and enough knowledge on a particular topic, then you, are, you can go to our portal and then you can appear the mock exam. So there is cardiology mock exam in, you, in the software. One is cardiology theory and there is also another one which is just on ECG. ECG is not a part of the two weeks free session, but for those of you who has enrolled in the course, you will get the ECG class. 
after these two week sessions are over. Okay. So that's how you are supposed to make your preparation. Starting with the chest pain. So if you are if you wonder that from where we have taken the taken everything in this lecture note, many we have taken from Kaplan step to CK book, and many we have taken from John Mutak. So it's a combination of all the important information. So chest pain. So chest pain is a very important topic for your exam. So if a patient presents to you with chest pain, what are the important differential diagnoses that you should think of? First of all, we think about cardiac related cause, most importantly, myocardial infarction, then angina, could be pericarditis, sometimes even young female having chest pain, we should also think about prolapsed mitral valve. Vascular could be aortic dissection, then we should also not forget about respiratory causes of chest pain, especially pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, pneumothorax. Can be GIT related, like esophagitis, gastroesophageal ulcer. It could be peptic ulcer disease, even sometimes biliary disease. Musculoskeletal is also important, especially patient can get a fracture of their rib. They can get costochondritis, sometimes also known as TJ syndrome. Sometimes it could be some cervical nerve root compression and that's causing the chest pain. So musculoskeletal chest pain is a very, very commonly presented in general practice. So we should be always aware of that. And how we should think that this is a musculoskeletal chest pain? If a patient complains that, well, my chest is very sore to touch. If you can, when you feel the rib, or when you feel the chest, if it is tender to touch, that's the time we think about possibility of musculoskeletal chest pain. Now, one by one, we will move on into the detail of these chest pain cages. Tonight, we are mainly focusing on, on the chest pain related to cardiac causes, not with any other causes. Okay, so mainly we'll be focusing on cardiac and vascular. So first of all, characteristic of the pain. So any pain, even by looking at the character of the pain, you can get an idea what could be the cause of that pain. So first of all, if it is chest pain related to heart attack, like ischemic heart disease or myocardial infarction, or even just angina, the type of chest pain patient describe is called, doctor, my, I feel very tight in my chest. So tightness, Heaviness, a pressured feeling is what we normally get in these patients. You can also get nausea, vomiting, excessive sweating. You can also get tachycardia, shortness of breath. All of these can present along with this chest pain. But the characteristic of the pain, which is cardiac origin, is tightness, heaviness, or pressured feeling. If patient says that I'm getting a sharp, stabbing, knife-like chest pain, it's likely that it is pericardial inflammation, which is what we call as pericarditis. If a patient chest pain get respond to nitroglycerin, it's likely that it is related to ischemic heart disease or esophageal spasm. But if chest pain get worse with nitroglycerin, think about likely possibility of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Sometimes acute coronary syndrome, which is basically we are talking about angina, myocardial infarction, patient also can have some other atypical symptom, especially dyspnea, shortness of breath, fatigue. Now, once we know about the characteristic of the chest pain, the next thing is some of the signs. So if you have got a patient who has like a stabbing, sharp, sudden, severe pain, and the pain going to the back, likely chance it could be an aortic dissection chest pain. Aortic dissection, if you check the blood pressure on their both arms, sometimes you can get a difference between the systolic blood pressure of your, 
of your both arm. So there might be a difference of systolic blood pressure in the both arms in case of systolic, in case of aortic dissection. And it can be present in 70% cases. So a difference of more than 20 millimeter systolic blood pressure in both arms suggest aortic dissection. If patient having associated fever, then think of myocarditis, pericarditis, pneumonia, okay? Sometimes mediastinitis, those will be your main, main possibility. Coming to some of the other abnormal sounds. If you have got a patient who has got, let's say, new lift bundle branch block. Now, it might be a little bit difficult for you to get, get to understand this lift bundle branch, right bundle branch, but when we discuss the ECG, it will become much easier. So if you have got a new, like patient doesn't have any symptom, and, but you did an ECG, and in the ECG, for the first time, you have got a new onset of left bundle branch block that is always concerning. So any new LBBB suggests there is a likely possibility of acute coronary syndrome. So we should be careful about it. A new fourth heart sound can be found in myocardial infarction. If you get a third heart sound, likely possibility is that patient can have an underlying heart failure which is what we call as S3 gallop rhythm. All right, so these are the important signs that you'll be looking for. Now, once we have taken history from the patient about the characteristic of the chest pain and the full history of the chest pain, and then we did the physical examination, we found some of the findings that we have discussed out, then we do some investigation. Right? So in exam, many times investigation is the first question that they ask. So they give you a symptom and they ask you that what is the next most appropriate investigation for this patient? So if a patient having chest pain, all patients with chest pain should have a ECG done initially. This is the single most important test for chest pain evaluation. Okay? So what are you going to do if a patient having chest pain? The initial investigation is ECG, especially if you think that this is a cardiac origin chest pain. Most of the patient who has got myocardial infarction will have some abnormal ECG, but sometimes ECG even can be normal in myocardial infarction. What else we can do after ECG? The second most important thing is to do the cardiac enzymes. There are lots of cardiac enzymes, like we can do CKMB, we can do cardiac troponin. Which one is the most important one between CKMB and troponin? Troponin. So troponin is the most important cardiac enzyme nowadays that we always do. It's very unlikely that we do cardiac or CKMB anymore these days, unless it is really needed. Now, there are some difference between the CKMB and cardiac troponin. So CKMB, typically detectable in the blood of a patient four to six hours after onset of myocardial ischemia. It gets picked in 12 to 24 hours, and then it becomes normal in two to three days. Okay? Now, troponin. Troponin basically found in cardiac muscle. And in case of cardiac troponin, most of the time what happens that initially if you do it like after two hours of chest pain, you have done a cardiac troponin. You might not get troponin elevated at that time. There are some timeline from where we can find out that when troponin will be elevated in a patient with myocardial infarction. Important to know that even CKMB, troponin, all of this, it's usually you will be able to find out four to six hours after the onset of ischemia. So if you do it in two hours time, the troponin or CKMB will be normal. Will you just say that you are totally fine and you can go home? No. There's the reason if you suspect a patient to have 
myocardial infarction or even acute coronary syndrome, your initial troponin can be normal. So you always have to do some repeat troponin and repeat ECG just to confirm that if there is any changes later on. So we never discharge a patient based on a single ECG or based on a single troponin value. We always repeat it, usually after four, every four to six hours. Now you can see that CKMB usually will be elevated just for one to two days, but troponin can be elevated up to two weeks. So again, if someone presents like a delayed presentation after onset of chest pain, which one is more appropriate to order? Troponin, because it will be more elevated. Now let's say you have got a patient with myocardial infarction. You have treated the patient. Okay, now seven days after that episode, patient again starts to have a chest pain. What investigations you are going to do now? CKMB or troponin? Guys? CKMB, because troponin can be elevated for at least two weeks. So this might not be a best idea because if we are thinking about reinfarction, CKMB, again, after, after seven days, if CKMB is elevated, this is a new infarction. So if we normally think about finding out, a, finding out that if the patient has got a reinfarction, then we should go for CKMB. This is usually the only time we order CKMB at the, at the first. But in every other time, nowadays troponin will be your first line investigation for, for any kind of cardiac enzymes. Okay, but only for reinfarction, we can do the CKMB. Next, move on. So after you have done the cardiac enzyme, what else can be done in a patient with chest pain? You can do a chest X-ray, especially chest X-ray can show if there is any pneumothorax, pneumonia, pleural effusion, even sometimes if it is an aortic dissection, you can get widening of the mediastina. Now, let's move on one by one to the causes of chest pain that we are discussing. So aortic dissection is one of the important differential diagnoses of sudden onset chest pain. So if you have got a patient who presents to you with a sudden onset, sharp, extremely severe, tearing kind of chest pain that radiates to the back. All right? And what you can get in the sign, you can get more than 20 millimeter systolic blood pressure difference in between the both arms. You can get white mediastinum on chest X-ray, but the diagnosis is basically done by a transesophageal echocardiogram. We will come into more detailed discussion about this, but get an idea about this, like the, the presentation first. The investigation management will be discussed in detail later on. Pulmonary embolism, we, are, we will discuss it in our respiratory class, not now. Pericarditis. Pericarditis is a classic picture of chest pain. Many times, a let's say 25-year-old patient coming to you with a sudden onset left-sided chest pain. The chest pain is sharp. And it can also be like a, they can also say it's a stabbing chest pain or a sharp pain. But the pain has a classic picture, which means the pain gets worse after taking a deep breath or after coughing or after long inspiration. So if the pain gets worse after taking a deep breath or coughing, also if pain gets worse after lying down and gets better on leaning forward, 
that's the likely possibility of pericarditis. In pericarditis, many times you will get a finding that maybe one week ago, patient had a recent viral flu-like illness. Most likely that that virus has also inflamed the pericardium causing this chest pain. So these are the main way to differentiate all of these causes of chest pain that we are discussing. So one by one, the important ones, so costochondritis, Osteochondritis pain will be exacerbated with inspiration, deep breath, or coughing. But the most important finding is that if you, if you touch the chest, it will be tender. Then reflux. Reflux, we know that patient will complain of a burning chest pain. They can also complain about like regurgitation of the food. They can complain of their mouth is getting full with saliva. So water brush, acidic brush, metallic test in the mouth. So th that's reflux presentation. If it is a peptic ulcer disease, the pain is usually epigastric area and the pain has relationship with food. So food can alleviate the pain or sometimes it can make it worse. Especially if it is duodenal ulcer, okay? Pain can get better with food. If it is a gastric ulcer, pain can get worse after having a food. So if the epigastric pain is related to eating, then we think about peptic ulcer disease. That's the one of the other thing that any middle-aged or elderly patient presenting to you with epigastric pain, you should always consider possibility of a myocardial infarction. So you should do a ECG to rule that out because many times the pain can be in the epigastric region, okay? So you might have just thought that the patient having a reflux, but when you did a troponin, you found that it's 3,000 or 30,000. So it happens. So any epigastric pain in a middle-aged elderly patient who has high cardiovascular risk, we should always do a ECG. Myocardial infarction, the pain is very classic. So sudden onset of left-sided chest pain, which feels like tightness, heaviness, pressure, radiates to the left arm, neck, and jaw, and the pain persists more than 10 minutes, that's when we think about myocardial infarction. Okay, pericarditis, we already know. Dissection aorta, we already know. And others is related to lung, which you will do in our respiratory class. So that's actually so far the differential diagnosis of chest pain. Now we are moving on to more important topic, which is ischemic heart disease. So ischemic heart disease can be asymptomatic and be symptomatic. And symptomatic has some other difference. So it could be just a stable angina or it could be a part of acute coronary syndrome. So this is how your blood vessels look like. And this is the lumen, right? And gradually, a patient can develop atherosclerotic plaque into their lumen, and the lumen becomes narrow and narrow. When it is not completely obstructed, patient usually gets the chest pain when they do any exertion. So chest pain that is brought on by exertion and gets better after taking rest or after taking a nitroglycerin, that's likely to be a stable angina. That means still a little bit of the lumen is not fully blocked. Now in acute coronary syndrome, most of the time, the lumen is either completely blocked or there is a very small lumen is still left, like a very minimal. Now we have divided acute coronary syndrome into unstable angina, non-ST elevated MI or ST elevated MI. ST elevated MI is also full thickness block. That means there is no blood supply after this block. And that's why it is the most important thing to rule out in a patient who has left-sided chest pain. Okay, so, so far we know that what is this symptomatic ischemic heart disease? 
We have a stable angina, unstable angina, and ST and non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. So what are the risk factors of having a ischemic heart disease? Lots of risk factor is there. So the risk factor can be smoking, can be high cholesterol, can be sedentary lifestyle, can be family history of cardiovascular issues. But what is the single most important one? So a couple of questions come in the exam. If they ask that what is the single most important risk factor for ischemic heart disease, that's your LDL cholesterol. If they ask what is the worst risk factor for coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease, that's diabetes. Because a patient who has got heart attack and having a diabetes, that's actually a high risk patient. And if they ask what is the most common risk factor for having ischemic heart disease, that's hypertension. So three things, most important, most common, and worst. So you have to remember this in this way. Let's have a look to this question. A 48-year-old woman comes to the office with chest pain that has been occurring over the last several weeks. The pain is not reliably related to exertion. Any pain which is not related to exertion, it's not a cardiac chest pain. She is comfortable now. The location is retrosternal. The pain sometimes associated with nausea, no difficulty breathing, pain doesn't, doesn't radiate beyond the chest, no past medical history. What is your most likely diagnosis? Gastroesophageal reflux, unstable angina, pericarditis, pneumothorax, pinch metal angina. So basically, you can easily understand that this is gastroesophageal reflux. Why? First of all, the chest pain is not related to exertion. So you can easily rule out unstable angina. And if it is a pneumothorax, it would not be for several weeks. Pneumothorax will come to you immediately. So it's still not the case. If it is a pericarditis, pericarditis pain has some specific feature and it also comes as an acute pain. Pringe metal angina, again, Pringe metal angina has exertional risk factor. It can get worse with exertion. So it's not a Pringe metal angina as well. Most importantly, if a patient is not menopausal, so a female patient before menopause has a very low risk of having a heart attack. Okay. You can see menstruating women virtually never have myocardial infarction. But I have seen even a 40-year-old having a MI. So nothing is like absolutely sure. But most of the time, menstruating women doesn't have myocardial infarction. The next question is, which one of the following is the most dangerous to a patient in terms of risk for coronary artery disease. Elevated triglyceride, elevated total cholesterol, decreased HDL, elevated LDL, obesity. As we discussed that in between this, the most important risk factor is LDL, okay? Now, there is a condition called tachosubo cardiomyopathy. It's not very important, but I would like you to just to know about it. So, tachosubo cardiomyopathy, it's a kind of chest pain which looks like a ST elevated myocardial infarction, but it's actually not. So, tachosubo cardiomyopathy, it's an acute myocardial damage. Most often, occurring in postmenopausal women immediately following an overwhelming emotionally stressful event could be divorce financial issues earthquake lightning strike hypoglycemia and this causes massive catecholamine discharge from their body and that catecholamine can cause ballooning and left ventricular dyskinesia left ventricular dyskinesia means that your left ventricle needs to move to pump the blood to your aorta. This kinesia means that left ventricle is not moving properly. And that can also result in lack of blood supply to your body. 
Age with ischemic disease, this patient should be managed with beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. Revascularization will not help because the coronary artery is not abnormal in this patient. Okay. So why you are giving beta blocker? Because there is an excess adrenaline discharge in this patient. So you have to lower down the adrenaline secretion. Adrenaline can increase your heart rate, can cause vasoconstriction. So if you give the beta blocker, that will be mediated. Okay. So a postmenopausal woman develops chest pain immediately on hearing the news of her son's death in a war. She develops acute chest pain, dyspnea, and ST elevation in lead V2 to V4. You have got elevated level of troponin, and you confirm that this is an acute MI. Then you did a coronary angiogram, which can look inside the coronary artery to find out where is the block. So that coronary angiogram came back normal, which means that there is nothing wrong in the coronary artery. You also did a provocative test. This provocative test is done for fringe metal angina to see that if you do the provocation, does the coronary artery gets into vasoespasm? But there is no vasoespasm on provocative test as well. So it's not even fringe metal angina. Then you did an echocardiogram, which showed that there is left ventricular ballooning. If you get left ventricular ballooning or left ventricular dyskinesia, then you can confirm that this is Tacosupocardiomyopathy. Okay? And the answer in here is massive catecholamine discharge. Don't get too much concerned about that because it doesn't come in exam often. Now, next question, correcting which of the following risk factor for coronary artery disease will result in the most immediate benefit for the patient? Diabetes, smoking, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, weight loss. Always remember, smoking cessation results in the greatest immediate improvement in patient outcome for coronary artery disease. Sometimes if you can reduce or stop smoking, the risk of having a heart attack, it they actually decrease significantly rather than any other risk factor that is written here. So the single most important risk factor is coronary for, for preventing coronary artery disease is to stop smoking. Now, let's move on into a little bit more complicated discussion. Are you guys with me so far? You are understanding what we are talking about? Good. Now, we have got a patient who has got left-sided chest pain. Sounds like it's an acute coronary syndrome. So if we think it's an acute coronary syndrome, the next investigation is ECG. So we did an ECG. Two things can happen. One, you can get ST elevation. If you get ST elevation, you don't even need cardiac troponin to confirm the diagnosis of ST elevated MI. Okay, so ST elevation on the ECG, that's confirmatory diagnosis that this patient has got a MI. But you haven't got any ST elevation. What it can be then? Two things can be possible. It can be unstable angina or it could be a non-ST elevated MI. How to differentiate between these two? If you do troponin, Troponin will be negative or normal in unstable angina. But if troponin is positive, then it's non-ST elevated MI. That means there is no ST elevation, but cardiac marker is elevated. So the term that we use for such case is non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. So that's one of the important things that if we don't get ST elevation on ECG, but it's still patient has got chest pain, we should do a cardiac troponin, and then we can differentiate between these two. We have been talking about ST elevation. What is this ST elevation? Basically, if you know a little bit about ECG, so your ECG is like this. 
So that's the normal P wave followed by QRS and that's T. This is what we call as ST wave, this one. You can see that there is a baseline over here. So that means the ST wave or ST segment should be on this isoelectric baseline. If somehow this ST wave comes like this, then we call it ST elevation. Just like this, so you can see that this patient, this is the isoelectric line, but now having ST elevation. So that's how we look ST elevation in a ECG. When we discuss ECG, we will go through that in detail. So therefore, in establishing the diagnosis of non-ST elevated MI, cardiac troponin should be used to distinguish from unstable angina. Now, about the prognosis, the worst prognosis is ST elevated MI, followed by non-ST elevated MI, and then unstable angina. That means stable angina, better prognosis, then, then, then little bit worse is unstable angina, then more worse is non-ST elevated, and the worst to get is ST elevated MI. Now, one of the important thing to understand that your heart is supplied by coronary arteries, right? So you have got right and then in the left. So if any of this coronary artery is fully blocked, let's say there is full block of this artery, that means the blood cannot reach this part of your heart. And this part of the heart is not getting any blood supply and it's getting myonecrosis or there is complete death of muscle over this area, right? So in such case, that is what we will call it as ST elevated MI. And if you can either dissolve this clot or if you can remove this clot, then you can restore the blood flow here. So that's what we call as thrombolytic therapy. So thrombolytic therapy is beneficial in this patient with ST elevated MI, but in case of unstable angina or non-ST elevated MI, you don't need to go for any thrombolytic therapy because there is still a small part of this lumen is still not completely blocked. So it is not effective in unstable angina or non-ST elevated MI to go for thrombolytic therapy. Thrombolytic therapy is only needed or ST elevated MI. Now, coming to the characteristic of chest pain or ischemic chest pain. So we know that duration is one important thing. Normally we say that stubble angina chest pain lasts less than 10 minutes. Anything more than 10 minutes, we are worried that it could be an acute coronary syndrome. Most of the time, the provocating factor are physical activity, cold, or emotional stress. Along with the pain, patient can also complain shortness of breath, nausea, excessive sweating, dizziness, lightheadedness, or fatigue. Quality of the pain is squeezing, tightness, heaviness, pressured feeling. I would not say burning or aching, but mostly squeezing or tightness. But it is never sharp or stabbing or knife-like pain. It, most of the time, the pain is left-sided chest pain or substernal chest pain. If it is a stable angina, the chest pain will be elevated by taking rest or nitroglycerin. We did discuss about this finding, like if someone has got chest wall tenderness, it's likely costochondritis. If the chest pain radiates to the back, and unequal blood pressure between arms, that's aortic dissection. Pain that got worse with lying flat and better with sitting up, pericarditis. Pain gets worse or better after eating, that's peptic ulcer disease. And then we, know, we will talk more about these respiratory causes when we discuss the respiratory system. Okay, so, so far you have got an understanding that how we do the difference between each of these 
ischemic heart disease subtype. And you also know what we do in case of a patient presenting to us with a possible acute coronary syndrome. So we do a ECG. If ECG is normal, we do troponin. And then we treat the patient accordingly. Now, there are a few other things which you also need to understand before we move on of acute myocardial infarction. We should also know that if a patient only having stable angina, like chest pain on and off, mainly related with exertion, and you did a cardiac troponin normal, that means it's just an angina. What will you do in such patient? And is there anything else that we can do? Yes, we should do some more. So to confirm angina, there are some tests that we can do. One of the most common tests that we do for confirming angina is called a stress test. So either we call it a stress test or we call it ETT, which is exercise tolerance test. So in case of a stress test, Few things we also need to understand that stress test mean you will need to ask the patient to run on a treadmill while you are checking their ECG for any kind of ischemic changes. And also if a patient complaining of any chest pain during that time. So exercise tolerance test, it is indispensable tool to evaluate chest pain when the etiology is not clear and the ECG is normal. Now, before you send someone for this stress test, two things you need to know. One, that the baseline ECG is completely normal. And second, patient is able to exercise. Like if you send a patient who has got severe osteoarthritis of the knee joint to run on a treadmill, that's not realistic. If you send a patient who has got a fractured tibia, to run on a treadmill, that's not good. So patient needs to, ex needs to be able to exercise or run on a treadmill. And also there should not be any baseline ECG. Now let's say that's not possible. Either your patient is not able to exercise or there is some baseline ECG abnormality. What will you do next? If you can't read the ECG, because there is some baseline abnormality there, you must find a different way of detecting ischemia in the heart. The two best method of detecting ischemia without having any use of ECG is either you do a nuclear isotope scan, which is basically the thallium scan, or you can do an echocardiogram and you can look for any regional wall motion abnormalities. Like in the echocardiogram, we can look into the heart muscle and we can see that which part of the muscle is not moving as it should be. Let's say left ventricle, this part is not moving that much. Then you can think that maybe this part of the heart is not getting enough blood supply. That's why I'm getting this abnormal wall motion in this side. So that also gives you some idea. So you do this nuclear isotope scan, or you can do an echocardiogram to look for any wall motion abnormalities. What are the usual baseline ECG abnormality? Could be left bundle branch block, could be left ventricular hypertrophy. Patient might be taking, patient might be already on a pacemaker. In such cases, you can't do ECG or a stress test. Now let's talk a little bit about this thallium scan or this nuclear scan. This is also commonly known as myocardial perfusion scan, in which you insert this dye or nuclear isotope and a normal heart muscle, which is the myocardium, should pick up this isotope equally everywhere. If, the, if that muscle is alive and perfused, that muscle will pick up this die. But if there is any decreased thallium uptake in any part of the muscle, that suggests again that this part of the heart is not getting enough blood supply. So this is what we do in the thallium scan or myocardial perfusion scan. 
And we already know about the echocardiogram. We mainly look for any decreased wall motion. So that means if a patient having some baseline ECG abnormality, our two next option is either we can do a helium scan or we can do an echocardiogram. Is this understandable so far, guys? Because this is actually a little bit complicated than what we are going to discuss throughout this class. So this is the most complicated one. So starting with that, like if you have got a patient who has got angina, like chest pain on exertion, you have done ECG, there is no abnormality. Then you think that, well, why this patient getting chest pain on exertion? This, this must be angina. So let's send the patient for a exercise test or a stress test. When you can do that, if the baseline ECG is normal and patient is able to exercise. So that's fine. If the patient having some baseline ECG abnormality, then you can't send the patient for a stress test. Then you have these two options. Either you do a nuclear isotope scan, which is a thallium scan, or you can do an echocardiogram. This test is for patient who is able to do exercise, but they are having baseline ECG abnormality. No, we don't do exercise tolerance test in unstable angina. Only for stable angina. What if patient cannot exercise? If a patient cannot exercise, then there are alternative method that you can actually let the heart exercise by giving some chemicals from outside. So that's what we call as dobutamine echocardiogram or dipyridamol scan. Give dipyridamol from outside and then you do a thallium scan. Same thing will happen when patient was running on a treadmill. So this dipyridamol will act in your heart that as it, it is doing exercise. So this patient cannot exercise, but you need the patient's heart on exertion. So this dipyridamol will act in that way. And after giving dipyridamol, you can actually put the patient into the thallium scan. Okay? Same with echocardiogram. Patient cannot, cannot exercise. So what you can do, you can give dobutamine that will again act in the same way as if patient is running on a treadmill. So you give dobutamine followed by do an echocardiogram. So this is actually all the, all the things that I have discussed so far. First of all, we have exercise tolerance test. We only do exercise tolerance test if two things is there. The ECG is normal and patient is able to exercise. Okay, now if patient is able to exercise, but ECG is not normal. Then you have got exercise thallium and exercise echocardiogram. Okay, so patient will run on the treadmill, but you will have to insert the thallium dye inside the patient. Or patient will exercise while you do the echocardiogram. Now let's say the ECG is normal but patient is not able to do exercise. That's the time you do chemical stress test. How? You give dipyridamol in the thallium scan, or when you're doing the echocardiogram, you give dobutamine so that the heart is as if it's doing exercise. Is it understandable for everyone? Now it should be clear because that's, that's how usually we, we decide what kind of test we are going to do in such patients. Good, very good guys. Okay. Now let's have a look to this one. A man with atypical chest pain 
is found to have normal nuclear isotope uptake in his myocardium at rest. So this is actually the thallium scan. On exercise, so at rest, thallium scan is normal. On exercise, there is decreased uptake in the inferior wall. Two hours after exercise, the uptake of isotope returns to normal. What does it mean? This means that this patient has got an angina or ischemic heart disease. What we are going to do next? Coronary angiogram, bypass surgery, percutaneous coronary intervention, which is basically putting a stent in the coronary artery, which is angioplasty. Or you want to do dobutamine echocardiogram or nothing. Now, that means that there is always a reason why we are doing all of these investigations. What we are looking for, right? So let's say you have done a thallium scan and thallium scan shows this patient has got some underlying ischemic heart disease. The next thing you need to know, so thallium scan is not confirmatory. Sometimes it can be false positive. To confirm that this patient has got some kind of block in the coronary artery, you have to go in. So that's the time you do a coronary angiogram. Coronary angiogram means you put that rubber catheter in the groin of the patient, and then you go into the coronary artery, and you look into each of the coronary artery and find out how much blockage is there. And then you can treat the patient accordingly. Okay, so coronary angiogram is indicated if any of these tests come back positive. Let's say if a patient has got, if the stress test is positive, you need to send the patient for coronary angiogram. Any of these tests come back positive, the next test will be angiogram. So angiography determines if this patient is normal or the patient needing bypass surgery or angioplasty, which is a standing. So angiogram is used to detect the anatomic location of the coronary artery disease. What is the most accurate method of confirming coronary artery disease? Angiogram. So angiogram is the like the best test which can confirm coronary artery disease. If there is a narrowing of less than 50% of coronary artery diameter, that is insignificant. If more than 70% stenosis, that's neat surgical correction. So now coming to this part, that how we manage this patient. It's not the acute myocardial infarction patient, but the stable angina patient. So you have got a patient who has likely possibility of ischemic heart disease. You did the ECG and the ECG was normal. Okay, so resting ECG abnormalities, no. So no ECG abnormalities, then you find out if the patient is able to exercise. So if patient is able to exercise ECG normal, what we can do, we can just do an exercise stress test. If patient is not able to exercise, then you do a chemical stress test. If there is baseline ECG abnormality, but patient is able to exercise, then you do those exercise echo or thallium scan. Okay, now we know about it. Any of these come positive, we send the patient for angiogram. In the angiogram, if you have got one or two vessel disease, which means that Either one or two vessel, patient having more than 70% stenosis, then the idea is to go for angioplasty. That means put the stent in those vessels so that this vessel doesn't get complete blockage. If it is a three vessel disease or even left main coronary artery, or two vessel disease in diabetic patient, still they need a CABG. Basically, remember one or two vessel, stent, three vessel disease, coronary artery bypass grafting. So CABG will be the choice in that patient. 
clear for everyone? Good. Now, time to time, you'll see this alter monitor in your option. If you don't know what it is, then sometimes you just choose it incorrectly. So what is halter monitor? It is a continuous ambulatory ECG monitor. That means throughout the 24 to 48 hours, halter monitor will be attached to your body and it will record your heart rhythm disturbance. That means it will record the heart rhythm throughout this 24 to 48 hours. Many times, patient can present to you with syncopal attack or maybe feeling dizzy sometimes. And you did a resting ECG, but that's normal. But you think that, well, maybe this patient has some, some underlying arrhythmia, which I'm not able to find out now. So what I'm going to do now is to put this patient on this halter monitor and throughout, throughout these next two days, if there is any arrhythmia, either it's a ventricular arrhythmia or if patient having conduction delay or patient even having a heart block, I should be able to pick it up. So this is actually a test not to detect myocardial ischemia, but to find out any rhythm disturbance, which we can't find in a baseline ECG. Okay, so that's why we do halter monitor. Okay, so, so far, so good, I understand. Let's take a 10 minute break, everyone. And then we move on to the management of acute myocardial infarction. Okay, so 10 minute break right now. Thank you.
All right, everyone, let's start again. Okay, some of your questions. So if there is an abnormality in the halter monitor, what to do next? Halter monitor is a rhythm disturbance, right? So it depends on what kind of rhythm disturbance you have got. And based on that, you will treat it accordingly. So there are different treatment based on what you get. If it is a hard block, treatment will be different. If it is some kind of like a conduction delay or you are getting frequent ventricular ectopic beats. So it depends what kind of arrhythmia you get. And based on that, treatment will be different. Lecture notes is in the portal. If you are a part of the course, then only you get it. And that's like everyone who joined the course, they usually get the notes from our portal. But as a part of the free week session, you don't get our notes. Okay, moving on to myocardial infarction management, right? A 48 year old woman comes to the office with chest pain that has been occurring over the last several weeks. The pain is not related to exertion. She is comfortable. Location is retrosternal. No other problem. ECG normal. What is the most appropriate next step in management? Now, basically, there is nothing we need to do because it is unlikely that this is a case of angina even. But again, in exam, the option matters a lot. What options you have get you have got based on that you will have to choose it. Okay. Now, we haven't got any, any other options that it is just a reflux case. So if you have got a patient who has chest pain for several weeks, ECG is normal. What do you want to do? You want to do a cardiac troponin, echo, exercise tolerance test, angiogram, what you normally would do in, a, in such a case. For something which is happening for several weeks, can it be myocardial infarction? Very unlikely. We would not be thinking about myocardial infarction if a pain happening for a month, right? So for that case, doing a CKMB or troponin is not the important state. Rather, if you can find out that if it is a if it is an angina or not by doing a stress test, that will be the most appropriate thing to do. So exercise tolerance test will be the ideal state if chest pain occurs over several weeks. Now, moving on to management of acute myocardial infarction, which is one of the most important topic. So any patient presenting to you with possibility of acute MI, you should first consider giving them aspirin. Unless contraindicated, aspirin is recommended in every patient because this has a life-saving approach. If one thing that can save the muscle of a patient who is having myocardial infarction at the moment, that's aspirin, at least part of the medical management, okay? So antiplatelet therapy, sometimes we do those antiplatelet therapy based on what kind of myocardial infarction patient has got. If we think that this patient has got acute MI, sometimes we also add dual antiplatelet, especially after the procedure has been done. That means it's a ST elevated MI. Obviously, you are going to send the patient for urgent angiogram, followed by angioplasty or bypass, depending on, on, depending on the finding that you get. So in those patients, you will just start them with aspirin, send the patient to the catheter lab for a urgent, angioplasty. After the procedure has been done, then before you discharge those patients, you can put those patients on dual antiplatelet therapy, which has aspirin with clopidogrel. So avoid clopidogrel in patients likely to require emergency coronary bypass surgery, because if you start that, patient can bleed heavily during the procedure. Okay. Give heparin along with the recommended antiplatelet therapy for unstable angina or non-ST elevated MI. 
for unstable angina or non ST elevated MI, thrombolytic therapy, such as angioplasty or, or doing some like streptokinase, retiplase, those are not your urgent treatment. For them, heparin is one of the important treatment that we go for. Now, we will move on detail one by one. Let's have a look to this question first. You have got a 70-year-old woman comes to the emergency department with a crushing substernal chest pain for the last one hour. ECG shows ST segment elevation in V2 to V4. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? You want to do CKMB, oxygen, nitroglycerin, aspirin, thrombolytics, what do what you want to do for this patient? Now, as you can see, a lot of you has a lot of answer in your head. I know that when you get a patient who has got myocardial infarction, we follow the monotherapy. The monotherapy is what we call as morphine for chest pain, oxygen, if the saturation less than 95%, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. Now, just because in monotherapy, M is at the first, doesn't mean that morphine is your first thing that you would do. You have to think that which one among this mona has the life-saving approach. That's the first thing that you are going to do. And among all of this, aspirin has the highest chance of saving the cardiac muscle. Now, can you, do we need to do a CKMB level or, or troponin level in this patient? No need. Why? Because first, we already got ST elevation, and this patient just having the pain for one hour. You would not get troponin or CKMB elevated in one hour, right? So doing that will not add anything. So if we go to our answer, aspirin lowers mortality with acute coronary syndrome, and it is critical to administer it as rapidly as possible. With only one hour since the onset of pain, neither CKMB nor troponin will be elevated yet. Morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin should all be administered. We are going to give everything, but they do not lower mortality and they are not as important as aspirin. That's why aspirin should be given simultaneously with activating the catheter lab, which means that you give the aspirin and then you, you call the catheter lab so that the lab can be arranged for urgent angioplasty for this patient. Is this clear? Good. So now the next question that comes in the head that after you have started the patient with aspirin, the patient should be transmitted, transferred to ICU. But you must always initiate therapy and testing before you simply move the patient to another part of the hospital. Now, aspirin is simply recommended to be given first. Then you can follow it with another form of revascularization, which is basically the, the coronary angiogram followed by angioplasty. You might ask me that they're asking about the next step, they're asking about the initial step. 
There are questions in the exam in where we have to think about what is the most important thing as part of my management, right? Even though they're asking about the next step, in a patient who has got ST elevated MI, what is your next step, by the way? Is it important that you give them oxygen where we don't even know what the actual oxygen saturation is from the stem? What is important, giving the morphine for chest pain or saving the cardiac muscle? Saving the cardiac muscle is the most important thing. That doesn't mean that you are not going to give morphine, you are not going to administer oxygen or nitroglycerin in this patient. The question that you should ask in the head that what's going to save my patient mostly, okay? In anywhere else, we always make sure patient is pain-free. So patient coming to you with a headache, we will make sure patient gets a painkiller first. Everywhere, we make sure patient's painkiller is the first thing that we look for. But one of the thing is cardiac chest pain, where even before the pain, the main, main thing is to make sure the heart muscle is saved. Every second that we are wasting, some part of the muscle is becoming totally non-viable. Okay, so that's why next step for any patient who has possibility of MI should be aspirin unless patient has any contraindication to it. This is a tricky part. Once aspirin has been administered, so the next question is 70-year-old patient coming to you with a substernal chest pain for the last one hour. Okay. Now you have done an ECG. It shows ST elevation in V2 to V4. Okay. Aspirin has been given to this patient. After aspirin, what is your next most appropriate step? Now, that's one of the other controversial thing in the exam. We have, in case of acute MI, the main thing is revascularization. We have to ensure whatever we choose in the option has to be a part of revascularization protocol. Okay, that means aspirin is a revascularizer. What's the second most important Revascularization, giving something which can dissolve the clot or removing the clot. So you can either think of thrombolytic or there is also angioplasty. Thrombolytic is basically the medication that we can give to dissolve the clot, which is a streptokinase, LTPlase, retiplase. This, this is our second line option. The best is angioplasty. If a patient is in a tertiary hospital where there is catheter lab available, idea is to take the patient to the catheter lab for angioplasty within 90 minutes of arrival into the hospital. Okay, so angioplasty is our first option. Now, when we choose thrombolytics, let's say a patient coming to you with acute ST elevated MI in a rural hospital where there is no catheter lab available. And you, you need to, even if you send the patient by air ambulance, it will take four hours for the patient to transfer. Now, can we wait for four hours? No. We can't wait for four hours because patient has already entered into the hospital and then we don't, we only have 90 minutes to do anything for this patient. So some form of revascularization. Either we do thrombolytic or angioplasty. If angioplasty is not possible, what's the next best option? Giving the thrombolytic medication. Is this understandable for everyone? You might be thinking that why not choosing others? It is, as I say, that all of these are important. Morphine, oxygen, nitrate should be given to the patient immediately, but they do not lower the mortality of the patient. So in case of acute MI, the exam wants you to know what is the most important state. 
The first step is aspirin. Next step is send the patient to the catheter lab. That's what we normally think of in cardiac or MI-related cases. A lot of course, a lot of other candidates, a lot of people will say different. They will give you a lot of logic and you will be in a very much confused state if you hear all of those. I would rather say that I know that as, after aspirin, morphine, oxygen, nitrate has something to do with the patient management. But as part of the exam, if they say that they have given aspirin, they actually wants to know that after aspirin, what is the most important next step to do? Next step is to involve the catheter lab for angioplasty. Okay, they don't bother about giving morphine, oxygen, nitrate to this patient, which will be given to every patient anyway. Now, next question. A man comes to the emergency department with chest pain for the last hour that is crushing in quality, does not change with respiration or position. ECG shows ST segment depression in lead V2 to V4, aspirin has been given. Now, this is a tricky area. You have got ST depression, not elevation, which means it's not a ST elevated AMI. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? Now, if this patient would come to me after four hours, I would rather do a troponin first because I want to confirm my diagnosis that this is a case of non-ST elevated AMI. First of all, that option is not available here, right? So if you think that this patient having a ST depression in V2 to V4, and the pain just started for the last hour, doing a troponin or CKMB will not give you any finding at the moment. You can do a baseline troponin just to know that what's the troponin looks like in this patient. That's fine, we do it, but the option is not available in here. So if it is a ST segment depression, it can be found in a non-ST elevated MI patient. It can be also found in an unstable angina patient. So that's the reason we need the troponin to confirm that it's a myocardial infarction or just an unstable angina. Okay, so if troponin was in the option, I would still do it even though it is a one hour presentation just to get the baseline and then I would repeat it. But what's the most important step in this case? We know it's not a ST elevated AMI. So doing thrombolytics or sending the patient for immediate angioplasty will not, will, is not important right now. What's the most important step in a not, either it's the unstable angina or non-ST elevated AMI, starting the patient with low molecular weight heparin because it can prevent formation of further clot in the coronary artery. It cannot dissolve the clot that has been already formed. Unstable angina or non-ST elevated MI still have some part of the lumen left to be blocked. Now, if you don't give low molecular weight heparin, likely chance that small lumen will be blocked and this non-ST elevated MI will turn into a ST elevated MI even after a few hours. So for that reason, giving the heparin which will prevent further clot formation is the most important step in a patient who presents to you with unstable angina or non ST elevated MI. When the patient has acute coronary syndrome, but there is no ST elevation, there is no benefit of thrombolytic therapy. So this is a summary of treatment difference between a stable angina, unstable angina, or non-ST elevated AMI, and ST elevated AMI. All of these patients will get aspirin, beta blocker, nitrates. They also can get, sometimes if it is an 
non sta elevated mi sta elevated mi they will get dual antiplatelet drugs as well at the end of the treatment or after when they are getting discharged from hospital you can see here that thrombolytic has nothing to do with these two group but it is a alternative option for someone who cannot get pci or or angioplasty heparin is nothing to do with stable angina but you have to go for it for unstable angina or non st elevated mi heparin can be given in st elevated mi also but only after the the main treatment is done coming to the invasive management so early coronary angiogram within 48 hours and revascularization are recommended in patient with non st elevated mi and high risk fever so you might be thinking that why am i just going to stop after giving the heparin in a non in a non st elevated mi patient no it's not like that they are asking about what is the most important thing for a non st elevated mi patient not to have any further clot right so that's why we are giving heparin that doesn't mean that we are not going to manage the patient further this patient will need a coronary angiogram ideally within the next two days and when we do the coronary angiogram most likely we will get some block and during that time based on how many vessel has been involved you can either stent or do bypass grafting okay is this understandable for everyone that how we treat the non st elevated mi patient good now moving on to st elevated mi we know how the pain of st elevated mi presents we know everything about it so you can go through these notes later on we also know about what is the initial management for acute mi so monotherapy couple of thing you should also remember that nitrate can be given in a mi patient but nitrate or nitroglycerin is contraindicated if someone is having hypotension or if a patient is on sildenafil like viagra you cannot give them nitroglycerin so some contraindication is there so patient with st elevated mi usually have a completely occluded coronary artery with thrombus this eventually leads to myonecrosis restoring the coronary patency emergency perfusion as promptly as possible is a key determinant of short term and long term outcome so this is the most important line patient with st elevated mi who present within 12 hours of onset of ischemic symptom should have a reperfusion strategy either you go for percutaneous coronary intervention or you go for thrombolytic drug which is what we call as fibrinolytic therapy so any patient who presents to you within 12 hours of onset of symptom you can still consider to do this pci or fibrinolytic therapy now you might be thinking that what is all about that 90 minute that 90 minute is if that patient any patient with this myocardial infarction symptom when they present first time in your hospital when they present from that time up to 9 90 minute this is the time period you have to take this patient to the operation theater okay that doesn't mean that this 12 hours and 90 minute is completely different thing okay so someone who presents to you 7 hours after onset of the chest pain can you do percutaneous coronary intervention on that patient or not yes you can because it's still it's in the 12 hour period if the patient presents after 12 hours will you just go for fibrinolytic therapy no 
It's not like that. Patient presents within 12 hours. You can either do a PCI or fibrinolytic therapy, any of these two based on the availability. After 12 hours, management is a little bit different. At that time, doing urgent deperfusion doesn't matter. The damage has already been done. Okay, so the 90 minute thing, Dr. Priya, is that any patient who presents to you with a myocardial infarction symptom, let's say at the moment, patient entered into your emergency department door, within 90 minutes, you have to take that patient to the catheter lab for doing this angioplasty. Okay. And you can see patient presenting with non-ST elevated MI will not benefit from thrombolytics. So in a patient who has got ST elevated MI, this is how gradually the ECG changes happen. So first you get hyperacute T wave immediately, and then you also get ST elevation. One to several days later, Q wave starts to be there. And also six to 24 hours, you can get T wave inversion. So remember this because sometimes question asks that what is the first thing that you get in a ST elevated MI patient? Now, the emergency reperfusion therapy, the choice is between PCI, which is angioplasty, or thrombolysis. PCI is the best available treatment if, it's, if it can be given promptly, especially if patient presents within 12 hours. In general, a time delay of 90 minutes from the first medical counter to PCI is the maximum desirable. Thrombolytics. A streptokinase or tissue plasminogen activator, it can restore the perfusion to the ischemic area by lysing the clot. So this is a thrombolytic. That means it destroys the clot. The greatest benefit for giving the thrombolytic if you can do it within 12 hours of onset of symptom. But there are some contraindications of thrombolytic therapy. What are those? If a patient has active bleeding or bleeding disorder, significant facial or head trauma within the last three months, suspected aortic dissection, prior intracerebral hemorrhage, or ischemic stroke within the last three months. If any of this is present, then you can't go for thrombolytic therapy. You have to send the patient to the tertiary hospital for PCI. Coming to the late presentation. So you must be thinking that what will happen if a patient presents to you after 12 hours of these symptoms? So reperfusion therapy with either PCI or fibrinolysis is not routinely recommended in patients who are asymptomatic and hemodynamically stable and who present after 12 hours of symptom onset. That means in those situations, Emergency reperfusion is no longer needed as long as patient is vitally stable and symptom free. But again, this patient will need coronary angiogram. Ideally, within 48 hours, you will have to go for coronary angiogram, followed by either you can go for a stenting or bypass. So that's all the treatment that you need to understand about myocardial infarction. It is complicated. A lot of you has a, has a lot of ideas in your head, but you should get this basic idea after this class that this is exactly what exam wants you to know. If you can understand what I have said, nothing can come in myocardial infarction that you will get wrong in the exam. No, it's also hemorrhagic stroke. Prior hemorrhagic stroke is also a contraindication. So significant closed head trauma. What are the complications after myocardial infarction? Question sometimes asked, what is the most common or 
What is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in a patient with MI? The most common cause of sudden cardiac death in a MI patient is ventricular fibrillation. If a patient after having a myocardial infarction, few weeks later presents to you with a pericarditis-like pain, like the chest pain which get worse after taking a breath, deep breath in, after lying down and getting better after leaning forward, that pericarditis has a name known as Dresler syndrome. Same, your treatment will be same like pericarditis, chest pain, like aspirin, NSAID, or steroid. If a patient develops post-infarction angina, after you have treated the patient with PCI or thrombolytics, should be treated with a bypass surgery. That means, let's say you have got a MI patient and you treated with just a stent. But even after a stent, patient again getting angina-like pain and you have done CKMB or troponin showing these are still high. Send the patient for a bypass surgery. Now, moving on to some other causes of chest pain like fringe metal angina. Fringe metal angina is also known as variant angina. It's an uncommon cause of chest pain in which patient gets severe angina-like chest pain. And this usually occurs in relationship to some kind of stress, something usually triggers it. So if the coronary artery suddenly goes into a spasm, that causes lack of blood flow into the heart and causes the chest pain. You will also get ST segment elevation in here. As opposed to typical angina, Prince metal angina usually occurs during episodes of rest, most often at night and in the early morning hours. That means it is not related to exertion. Women with Prince metal tends to have fewer risk factors for coronary artery disease. Sometimes they can have history of migraine. Now, when you get this kind of angina chest pain, you always think about acute coronary syndrome. So first thing you will do is that you send the patient for exercise test. During exercise test, patient again can complain of chest pain. Then you send the patient for coronary angiogram that also came back normal. When these come normal, then you think that this is not related to coronary artery block. So the next thing that we do is to do this provocative test, which can cause spasm of coronary artery. So you do this argonovin spasm test. And argonovin can cause coronary artery spasm. And if after giving argonovin, patient complains chest pain, that will confirm your diagnosis. So how you are going to treat this patient? So you have to give something which can cause more vasodilation. So what causes dilation of the arteries? Either you can give nitroglycerin or you can give calcium channel blocker. Both of them can, can dilate the coronary artery and can help the patient with the blood flow. Okay, clear everyone what is Prince metal angina? Good. Next is aortic dissection. So aortic dissection is a one of the other important cause of chest pain. You already know that patient presents with sudden severe retroesternal chest pain, has a tearing or ripping sensation, and it radiates to the back, sometimes even can radiate to the abdomen, flank, or legs. If you check the blood pressure on both, there will be some difference between those how we are going to investigate this patient. The most definitive investigation for a suspected aortic dissection is transesophageal echocardiogram. Okay, if transesophageal echocardiogram is not available in the option, then you can choose CT angiogram. 
Treatment. Treatment basically depends on the type of aortic dissection. So if you know the anatomy, so this is the aorta. So this is your lips, brachiocephalic artery, right? Then carotid artery, and then subclavian artery. This is the lift subclavian artery, which means this supplies the lift arm. We divide aorta into type A and type B based on this lift subclavian artery. Any dissection or tearing of the aorta proximal to this lift subclavian artery is known as type A. And any dissection distal to this lift subclavian artery is type B. There is a huge difference between the management of type A and type B aortic dissection. Type A is very emergency one because it's closer to your heart and the only way to save the patient is emergency vascular surgery. Whereas type B, your initial treatment is medical treatment. So most of these patients will be hypertensive your job would be to lower down the blood pressure gradually. You cannot give nitroprusside initially. If you give IV nitroprusside or hydrolazine, blood pressure will drop suddenly, patient can even die. So idea is to start them with beta blocker. Even you can use IV beta blockers like IV labetolol. And once blood pressure going a little bit down, then you can add nitroprusside. So the first line management in case of type B aortic dissection is to lower down the blood pressure with beta blocker, likely to be an IV labetolol. Clear? So the type A is any dissection proximal to this left subclavian artery is type A, and type B is distal to this left subclavian artery. Pulmonary embolism, we don't discuss in our, this class, we will discuss it in our respiratory system. So that's all about our tonight's session, guys. And in the next class, we are going to finish the rest of it. So tonight is mainly focusing on chest pain plaster. And I hope that you, you understood most of the important confusing things that you you used to discuss in some telegram group or WhatsApp group, okay? Sometimes we always say that if you are looking for some answer, there are some website that we can follow. So MedBullets is one of the one that you can follow. RSCGP is Australian guideline, we should follow that. You can also read from Medescape that has discussion, like in a detailed discussion about anything that you want to know. So some websites also help you in understanding some of the topics that you are struggling with. So that will be our tonight class. I will allow you to ask any questions, even if you want to unmute yourself and want to ask, feel free to do that. And you can ask any questions about the course. So the soft copy of these books will be given in your Facebook group. That means in the course group, Dr. Gina. So everyone who has already joined the course, we have already given the soft copy in the Facebook group. So once you join, you can also get, get those soft copies. And soft copy is all that you actually need. If some of you wants to read hard copies, then you just need to buy it. The best investigation for aortic dissection is toe. That means the transesophageal echo. The plan for studying between the class days is 
once you join the course, you will get to see that there is a lot of videos of previous question solved class. Right? Those question solved classes are, are really, really good. And understand a lot of questions, how to solve them. Initially, in the first one month, I would advise you to finish the handbook of AMC MCQ, get to understand some of the question pattern, and also do the theory that we are doing. So read the JM, read the lecture note. That's the initial part. Once you know how to do the theory, start solving some Cuban questions, and also just whenever you get some time, go through our portal and just listen to the recorded classes of those question solve class. Okay, that's the ideal way. Get some steady partner as well so that you can solve questions with them. Now, Dr. Shah, if you have subscribed, there are a few things that you need to do. First thing is that we have obviously sent you an email writing what are the next step. So the next step would be First, you need to let us know that you have paid for the course. So send us a message in the messenger or in the email. Once we know that, we ask you to make an account in the portal. So once you make an account in the portal, then again, you need to let us know that you have done that. Then we will give you the access to the portal and you can get all these notes. Also, during that time, we will add you to our Facebook course group where you can get all the materials that you need. So if you haven't informed us, or if you're still waiting for those, that's the reason. Dr. Jinat, it's there because I, I still remember we have done it. So if you go to the featured section, it's not the first aid AMC MCQ group. That's not the course group. There is a course group for, for this batch. I'm not sure if you are added there. If you are added there, then you should be able to find out. If you still can't find out, just send me an inbox. I will check that if you are added to that Facebook group or not. We don't... We don't allow anyone to go into the software unless they are enrolled into the course. But I can assure you the software is one of the best thing that you can get among any course that's available in Australia. Okay, the software has almost five to six years of question solutions with notes as well as with the video format of all the classes that we have taken. Okay, we also take mock exams that's in the software that's exactly same like AMC MCQ exam. So that's, that's more than enough for your understanding that how the software is going to work. To admit, I will just discuss how the course works, then we can also discuss the procedure of admission. Prince metal angina is totally different from unstable angina. Unstable angina means coronary artery having atherosclerosis. Yes, every lecture that we take, it's already in the portal. So all the theory notes we have already given in the portal. So if you have got the access, then it's, it's in the portal already. Okay, Dr. Gina, Dr. Nushaneli, we will, I will have a look, okay? And I will tag you in that, in that post, okay?
The books are not given in the software. It's given in your Facebook group, Dr. Ketu. You were already our part of the previous course. So in the previous course Facebook group, we have given links of all the software. Should be able to find it out. The first aid AMC website is down today because we are doing some upgrade. So it should be available tomorrow. Okay, let's have a look at how we, what's the course is going to be and what's, what's normally we discuss in the course, okay? If you have some questions, then you can also ask at that time. Just one second, let me just clearly open this up. Okay, so this is how the course is going to be. Everything that's written in here is already given in your first aid AMC MCQ group as well, and also in our portal. Okay, so as you are aware that we started our class from 30th April. There was a trial class on 16th April, but the two weeks free session, we started from, from 2nd of May, right? Now, the course is designed in a way where you can get everything that you actually need to pass the exam. There is nothing else that you need apart from that we discuss. So we discuss full theory with you. Theory classes are just like how we did today. Then you have five-year sample question discussion that's given in the software. That's from 2018 to 2023, but we mainly focus on the most updated one during the course. But you can also get to know all other, all other years through the portal. You have one to two classes every week on the question solvations. In the software, you get lots of mock tests subjective, month-wise, even full mock test, which has 150 questions. QBank, you get access to the course notes until you pass. You get a recording of every class, which has extended access even after finishing the course. And also you can allow, we normally, you can go for some CPD hours if you do the class. So course fee is 499 Australian dollar. Class duration is five months, three days a week. Sometimes it can be four days a week as well. Now we are taking the class on Sunday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Sorry, not, no, no longer we take it on Tuesday. Now we take Saturday, Sunday and Wednesday. It has been updated. The time is now 8 to 10.30 p.m. Sydney time. We always take class on June. So, just like how we are doing now, that's how we do. We don't take classes on Facebook. It's just during this two weeks free session. So basically the theory is covered from all these guidelines that we are talking about. We also, after each theory, like we do two cardiology class, and after that, there will be a cardiology question solve. Same way we do question solve all of all the theory sessions that we do. Theory practice test. Once you finish a system, like once you finish cardiology, you can practice some mock test on the software, find out what you have done wrong. There are explanations on the theory test as well. You can also find out what did you do wrong in your exam. In this portal, you will get five-year recent sample question discussion as we discussed, and you can finish I always say finish from 2023 and then go backward if you have some time. You can, if you can at least finish 2023, that's more than enough to pass the exam. After you do our sample question discussion, there are some sample question mock tests that we update every month, okay? 
So always we update some new questions as we go. Software-based mock exams. So there are, this is this number always changing based on how much we are adding. So 20 subjective question, 40 sample questions, three to five full 150 question mock test. Now we have three, we are still adding two more full 150 questions, AMC model test, which means it's totally same like your exam. And if you can finish those three mock tests before your exam, and if you do, if you pass that, likely chance you will pass the exam as well. We also take extra classes on a lot of other things like STAT, ethics, ABG, fundoscopy, CTS scan, and everything. Okay, so that's more or less about the course. You can always go through that in the Facebook, as well as there is our website this one. So with this website, you can find out everything that's written here. This is the website where you will have to subscribe to get access to the portal. To enroll, either you can send a message in my messenger. So if you are part of First Aid AMC MCQ group, you know my ID. So you can just send a message or you can also send an email to this First Aid AMC 4536 at outlook.com. That will, that, that will go to one of our team member and he or she will help you to get admitted. So the classes is on Saturday, Sunday, and Tuesday. Are your lectures enough for preparation? Lecture is enough, but time to time, we will ask you to read a little bit extra from some book. In that case, you have to read that. But most of the, most of the things are already updated in the lecture notes. Okay, and you can always reach us through the First Aid AMC MCQ group. So if you are not, part of our First Aid AMC MCQ group. This is the group I was talking about. If you go to the feature section of this group, then you will be able to see everything, the most updated information, like the course details, everything is always updated in here, okay? Yes, so once you do the payment, you will also get all the classes that we take, all the missed previous classes as well. That's right. A lot of our students just do offline, which means that they can't join the live session. They, they, they join the five months course, but they just listen to the recordings when they get some time. That's also fine with us. Now there are MCQ, in the MCQ, we always provide some links for you to read. Yes, you should read that. If now not all of those links, but it's not always just solving the question. It's about learning that theory so that you can answer any questions that come from that particular topic. So when you solve a particular question, let's say you are solving a questions based on hereditary angioedema. Okay. So you have got a questions and you just, you know the management of hereditary and geodema. You don't know nothing. Just, you, do, you just know the answer of that question. Is this enough for, the, for your preparation? No. That's why we provide you the link so that you can, you can go to that hereditary and geodema, you read it properly and you, you know everything about it. And that's how it should be. You can't just memorize the answer of a particular question. There is no way that question will come to your exam. But if you know the theory, each and everything, then you can answer any questions that come in your exam. There will be other tutors which, who will be taking your recent question solve classes. Okay, you will get class with them. I think there are two classes with them as well as part of the two week session. And you can learn about them as well. They are very good teachers. Even sometimes some ones are better than me. So don't worry about it. 
They're, they're very beloved by our students and you will also love them. How much is for online classes? So the, the class online, offline, everything, it is 499 Australian dollar. Okay, I hope that it answers all of your questions, everyone. So the next class will be on the rest of cardiology and we finish cardiology. After that, there will be two classes on those random question discussions. And at the end of three two week session, we will do a cardiology question solve. Okay, keep an eye on the Facebook group and join the classes just like you are doing now. And study hard. Don't think that there is some shortcut. This is something which will let you to enter into Australia to work here. There is no shortcut in it. If you try shortcut in some part of your life, you will, you will understand that there is some lacking in your knowledge. And that's going to be much hurtful at that time. I would always encourage you to read it properly, get the ideas, because this is the lesson that's going to help you for the rest of your life. This is the knowledge that's going to help you to manage a patient in Australia. Being a safe doctor is very important. In your country, you might not be having risk to lose your registration. But in Australia, you can lose your registration within the blink of your eye. So it's important to gain those knowledge rather than just solving some QBank and thinking that I'm, I'm good to go for the exam. If someone is preaching that, they're actually, they're actually showing you the wrong way. And at some point of time, you will always feel that. You, either you will not pass the exam in the first attempt, you will go for third, fourth attempt, which I don't think it's really necessary because anyone who, who is steady perfectly, they can pass MCQ exam in their first attempt. So it means that either you did not do it right or you have listened to some, some wrong people. So it's not just you, it's not your fault because you did not know about it. And you, you have just listened to people that you felt it right. But once you know that that's not the right way, then you should make your choice and you should study hard because this is something which will help you for the rest of your life, right? So study hard, do the hard works, and there is no way you will fail this exam. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. We'll see you later in the next class. Bye.